Here we see Discovery on the launch pad out there. Everybody talks about how things move so fast in the space program. In our case, it took two months to get from T minus four seconds to T zero. <laughs> so that's not always true. Fortunately, the weather was just beautiful out there. It was nearly perfect. I think probably the best weather we've had for any of the shuttle launches yet. Here we show the main engines igniting and the twang, uh, the orbiter moving, was very apparent to all of us in the cockpit. You can see the twang. Those are the bolts firing on the solid rocket boosters. There was no doubt when the solid rocket boosters fired that uh, we were going someplace in a hurry. When we lifted off, uh, we had the heaviest stack that has uh, launched since the Apollo days in Saturn V back in Apollo, over four and a half million pounds lifting off. You see the roll right here. The roll seemed dramatic to us, I guess, because we're on the outside of the stack and uh, the real world was out there. It was a lot more dramatic, of course, than the simulator had been. We were actually carrying the heaviest payload uh, by about 10,000 pounds that had been carried by the shuttle. We had over 47,500 pounds of payload uh, we were lifting. You can see the shock wave right here. It's just behind the, the windows on the top of the orbiter as we're going through the maximum dynamic pressure here in ascent. We're actually throttling the main engines back here in two stages to get through the maximum dynamic pressure. As you can see, it's a beautiful day. We had separation of solid rocket boosters and a little film over the windows, just like we'd had on all the previous flights, but uh, not objectionable. We made it to orbit, and uh, we needed to get to work right away, because our flight day one uh, included deployment of the satellite business systems uh, satellite. And uh, we proceeded on with that task, and the, the uh, techniques involved were not different from those employed on previous PAM deploys. Here you see the sun shield opening. Of course, the purpose of the sun shield is to protect the satellite uh, from the sun while it's in the cargo bay, and that all was completely normal. My responsibilities in the deployment required that I be in the commander's seat using the uh, forward display tubes. Mike Mullane uh, helped with the PAM deployment at the standard switch panel in the aft, and the rest of the crew was uh, heavily involved in, in supporting the deployment, monitoring uh, systems, uh, and uh, keeping track of the number of uh, photo television documentary requirements that we had. The PAM, uh, as you know, is uh, not particularly sophisticated in terms of its uh, onboard guidance. It requires the orbiter to point it, and it's been stabilized in a method that you see here. Uh, a spin table in the orbiter's payload bay spins the satellite at about 50 RPMs to uh, keep it stable on its uh, way to geosynchronous orbit. In a second, you'll see the deployment of the SBS satellite, and uh, if you look very closely, you can see the camera wobble right at the instant of deploy, and that'll be evident in the picture. We felt and heard that, and it was uh, an appreciable jolt and quite a bit of, of bang, but uh, we were not surprised. We had heard that from previous crews. There, you can see the the camera jiggled just slightly, and uh, that was just exactly what we expected. Otherwise, we felt uh, nothing, and it was completely normal. The orbiter systems and the uh, satellite systems performed extremely well, and we were very pleased. Uh, the simulation that we have here in Houston is, of course, very good, and uh, both Mike and I commented that we felt we had done this a hundred times before. It felt very comfortable to do it in flight, and uh, we just expected it would work perfectly. On the morning of flight day two, we went to work on deploying the second satellite, the CINCOM, and as with Pam, it's a team effort. I was at the standard switch panel in the back again, and Steve was up in the front in the CDR seat. He operated, uh, the CINCOM is held on the payload bay by four motor-driven pins, and he was operating the computer to pull those pins. I threw some, he st Steve started a verbal countdown, and at uh, T0, I threw some switches that fired a pyrotechnic device that allowed the CINCOM to roll out of the payload bay. The CINCOM is like the PAM in that it's a spin-stabilized spacecraft, but unlike the PAM, it gets its initial spin stabilization at the moment of deployment. It rolls out of the bay with about a one and a half RPM spin and about a two foot per second translation away from the orbiter. The CINCOM is the first satellite, as Henry mentioned, communication satellite to be designed uh, to be carried strictly by the shuttle. It's going to be used by the United States Navy as a UHF radio communication relay satellite. It was essentially off in the payload bay. It 
turned on, turned itself on automatically at deployment. One of the first things that happened was that white antenna was deployed to allow the ground to communicate with the satellite. About 15 minutes after each of the satellites was deployed, uh, we got ready to do a, a burn on orbit using the maneuvering engines, 8,000 pound engines in the back of the orbiter. Uh, give, us a little, give us a little more separation before the perigee kick motor on each satellite fired, but 45 minutes after deploy. Uh, you'll see the engines ignite here just a second. Uh, after the ignition, you won't see anything while they're firing in the vacuum up there. There's the ignition, and now they're firing, you won't see very much. You'll see the tail off in just a second, and then right after the tail off, you'll see uh, one of our primary thrusters fire just to the right, on the right ohm spot there. There's the thruster firing. As I mentioned earlier in connection with the SPS deployment, we had a fairly awesome amount of uh, photo TV uh, requirements on this flight. You see the CDR with the IMAX camera. We were fortunate enough to uh, get some good IMAX uh, film of the uh, deploys and a number of in-cabin activities, and uh, Hank and Mike Coates get the credit for making that all work. One of the first that uh, Henry mentioned was the fact that ours was the first flight to deploy three satellites. And here's the third, the Telstar satellite uh, for AT&T. And uh, as with SBS, it was absolutely normal. There were no problems at all, and Mike and I felt very comfortable doing the task. One of the requirements we had was to, uh, to film using the uh, RMS wrist camera the burn of the perigee kick motor for all three satellites. And in a second, we'll show you the perigee kick motor burn for the AT&T satellite. Notice below on the ground the lightning in the clouds, and that was very noticeable, and we're glad we got it on tape to show you. There it is. And it was uh, so dramatic at night that the lightning on the ground would light up the payload bay. And it took me at least several seconds to figure out exactly what it was that was causing the light. And there's the perigee kick motor ignition. In all cases, the motors burned uh, exactly as predicted, and it's a fairly easy task for the crew uh, to monitor that, that burn. And as I mentioned, Judy had to position the arm from the cradle position to the observing position after each deploy. And uh, you can see the AT&T satellite on its way uh, to its transfer orbit, which uh, from our point of view appeared to be nearly in the direction of the constellation Orion, which you see in the upper right-hand corner above the Earth's limb. And we were very pleased with that shot. We thought that was quite nice. Beginning on uh, flight day one, I uh, started the uh, electrophoresis operations in space payload. Uh, some of the operations uh, included interaction with a microcomputer uh, at the electronics center of the payload, which you see behind me in this picture. The uh, majority of the payload work uh, was with the fluids system module, the large module that uh, you see me working at uh, here. There were several tests that I had to do manually at that module, calibrating flow rates, and uh, also uh, checking to find uh, the presence of the particular biological substance that, uh, that I was looking to separate and purify in the microgravity environment of space. And here I'm performing some uh, sample fluid sample collections and uh, using a small kit that was carried along, uh, determining the presence uh, and the quality of that material. The uh, payload operations, although uh, hampered by some problems, went well. We extended a large solar array wing several times during the flight. This is the largest structure ever deployed in space. It was 1,300 square feet, yet it only weighs 300 pounds. The purpose of the array is to supply electrical power to a spacecraft or a space station by using the sun's energy. A wing this size has about the same capability as one of the orbiter's fuel cells which is just about as much power as we typically use on orbit. The array unfolded just like an accordion being pulled up from the top by a coiled mast, which you can see in the front. Uh, the mast was made out of a fishing pole type fiberglass. And the blankets are pulled taut at two extension lengths, uh, 70 feet and 100 feet. Here we have a scan from the aft window up out the overhead window, giving you some idea of how large uh, the array really looked to us uh, as we were doing work with it. While the array was extended, we used the small thrusters on the orbiter to try to excite the mast. We found it to be very stable, showing only small deflections that damped out very rapidly. And we were able to maneuver quite nicely uh, to different attitudes with the array out.
Here we're coming across Baja. Uh, one of the things that we noticed about the array was uh, that it was translucent, so we could see uh, both the sun and the earth going by behind it as uh, we were maneuvering. All in all, it was a good flight test for large space structures with potential future use in either space-based construction or in space station operations. And it's also a potential prototype of an inexpensive power source in both dollars and weight uh, of the future for NASA. And we spent a lot of time uh, taking photographs with the various cameras that we had on board uh, of the operations of the mast. Here you see it extended to 100% uh, with the intermediate tension bar, the, the white bar across the bottom. And it was quite large. There's Henry trying to take a picture of the top. And in this uh, closing shot, we have a sunset. Uh, we can see the sun shining through the array. We were tail sun at that time. And when you see the shadow of the vertical tail on the left bottom portion of the array. For a new orbiter, we had remarkably few equipment malfunctions. Uh, one failure we did have was the, one of the three forward display units failed uh, shortly after orbit insertion. Uh, this was really no impact uh, to the flight, but after the satellites were deployed and the OST work was done, we decided to change it out with the aft uh, display unit, uh, which was no longer needed. Uh, so we did what we call an in-flight maintenance, or IFM. We broke out the toolbox and uh, uh, changed them out. There are some advantages and disadvantages to making repairs in zero-G. One of the advantages is you can float up into the nooks and crannies that are very difficult to reach on Earth, and they're very easy to reach on orbit. One of the disadvantages is you've got to remember to brace yourself uh, quite well when you're using the tools. It didn't do any good to outweigh the wrench by 185 pounds, zero G. But uh, we did change them out successfully and had three forward display units for entry and landing. It was along about the same time that we were doing the IFM that we discovered we had the icicle on the dump port. And uh, at this particular time, we just were going to go out and break it off. Uh, Judy came up and handled the communications and kept me honest with the, the RMS while we were doing this task, double checking on the procedures. The ground really did a super job in putting together the procedures to do it. Here's what it looked like as we started the wastewater dump. You can see the size of the icicle on the supply port. Now watch very closely at the bottom, the wastewater dump port, and you'll see that big icicle growing right before your eyes. It grew dramatically fast. I couldn't believe what we were looking at. We immediately stopped the wastewater dump and then spent two days with that side of the spacecraft to the sun to try to uh, warm up the icicle a little bit and let it sublime. We uh, were somewhat successful in that. The, as you'll see here shortly, the, uh, the size of the icicle was reduced. We took the procedures that the ground had sent up to us to use the arm, poised the arm, and uh, took a look at it. We had uh, people looking out the windows just to make sure we weren't going to bump into anything on the side of the orbiter, but uh, we didn't have to fear because the procedures were absolutely correct. Here's what it looked like the day we went to knock it off. You can see it is reduced in size, but it's still there. Uh, we're moving in very slowly with the arm now. And what happened is you move in, uh, you lose sight of it in the camera, so you, you just have to keep going. If you watch closely now, you'll see a little piece of ice go chipping off up to the top right-hand corner of the screen, and that's when we hit it. There it goes, a little chunk of ice there. Had no trouble whatsoever executing this procedure with the arm. The arm worked beautifully, as it has on all our flights. And when we pull back here, you can see just over the top of the end effector of the arm there, a little black spot. That is the dump port, and the ice is gone. Mike Mullane took this picture out the window as the chunk of ice floated by. And you can see it's a pretty good-sized chunk of ice. Uh, we were really relieved to see it gone. Now, it wasn't all work. Uh, here's Judy and Steve playing a little handball with our flight mascot. Zero gravity was a lot of fun. Here, Steve and I were demonstrating some of the physics of the Frisbee deploy that we talked about with CINCOM. Steve thought this up, uh, got a, a filter off of our hatch window, and we labeled it CINCOM, and 
we uh, floated it there in zero G and Steve gave it a tap just like the spring did on the real CINCOM and you see that it translates and rotates uh, straight up just exactly like the, the real spacecraft proven that uh, you know, the physics of a frisbee are the same in zero gravity as they are here on Earth. Wanted to show you a little bit about our food pep preparation. We carry mostly dehydrated food because we have water manufactured as a byproduct of the uh, fuel cells. Here you see a pack of dehydrated strawberries and you add two ounces of cold water to it and let it sit for a couple minutes and you got yourself dessert. And that's our water dispenser there that Charlie is operating. He's selected two ounces and he's uh, injecting the water into the plastic container. There's a plastic cover that, that holds holds the strawberries and the water inside. After you pull it out of that uh, device, you have to knead it for a little bit to rehydrate the food. This is particularly important for the shrimp cocktail to make sure you didn't get a dose of horseradish that would really water your eyes. Strawberries were, uh, they, they, were they were pretty good. There's, there's dessert. Here we are sitting down for supper. Uh, we had trays. You can see some of the food stuck to the back there. Uh, we had trays that we could position on our laps, Velcro, and then uh, set our food in them. As Steve pointed out, this uh, zero gravity adds new meaning to the term past the potatoes. They float them all the way across the cabin. The menu was uh, quite varied and uh, <laughs> really pretty good. People accused me, we had color code, and people accused me of always having my color on everything. <laughs> Exercise was part of our daily routine on orbit, uh, just like it is back here on Earth. Getting set up on the treadmill takes a little bit longer on orbit, but it feels just as good to quit. And our sleep arrangements looked a lot like uh, summer camp. A little bit of bunks here and there. Two of us slept anchored to lockers. Two of us slept strung across the room, and two of us slept on the wall. And you notice that in zero G, when you relax, your arms tend to float up. It was very comfortable. Mm -hmm. We didn't always sleep with the night light on. Well, uh, we chose a sunset as to all good things must come to an end, and you can see some thunderstorms sticking up in the, the limb of the Earth there on the horizon. Sunsets from space are absolutely beautiful. You've heard us say this many times. It's still true, and it's difficult to capture all the color on camera. We had a good flight and we came home. Here you see the RCS jets firing as the tracking cameras at, at Edwards picked us up a little over 100,000 feet. We had some test inputs that were put in by the computer, 11 sits tests throughout the entry to get data to verify the aerodynamics of the orbiter. And when those tests went in, it caused quite a bit of jet firing. When the last test was over at about 0.9 Mach, I took over manual control of the orbiter and then guided it around the head and alignment circle to a, a final approach. As we turned on final here, you'll see some streamers pull off the wingtips as we get the final alignment. Here we're about 13,000 feet picking up speed. We're about 280. Push over into a 19 degree glide slope. Uh, somewhere around uh, 2,000 feet, 1,800 feet, we begin to flare the vehicle out to a, a more nominal one and a half degree glide slope. At 300 feet, Mike put the gear down. That was a good sound to hear that coming down. And uh, we bring it in then for uh, on down closer to the runway where we break the rate of descent even further. The orbiter flies extremely well. I was quite pleased with it. It's a good solid handling airplane. Brought it in for a landing that we were all proud of and uh, about 185 knots, started the nose down. The nose went down per normal. Uh, to us, it seemed like it really banged down hard, but it always does because of the negative angle tack you have. Braked it to a stop. Took us, I guess, 25 or 30 minutes to get the orbiter shut down. It, you, the thing about the orbiter is you're not through flying until you get it all shut down. That takes a while. Got our legs under us and came out and looked at it. It was an extremely clean airplane, as you've probably seen in the pictures. It came through in fine style, minimum tile damage, and the systems on board were in extremely good shape, so 
We're real proud of it. It's a welcome addition to our fleet. We now have uh, three airplanes in our national transportation fleet. And I think the, we're in a position now that the agency can really go get serious about flying.